So a few years ago, I was sitting at my computer on a bright Tuesday morning, about to begin a productive day at work, when I received an email that sent me into a frenzied downward spiral that would forever change my life. Immediately after reading this email, I could feel the anxiety bubbling up in my chest. I became short of breath and dizzy. Panic was setting in. And you know what? Actually, we need to back up a little bit so I can give you a little bit of context. A couple years prior to getting that email, I went for a casual stroll in the woods near my home in New England, and as fortune would have it that day, I made a new friend. We'll call him Tiki. Now, little Tiki must have been exhausted and starving because he tucked himself deep into my leg and started feeding on my human blood for three days. When I finally discovered this mischievous little stowaway, of course, I politely asked him to leave, using only the finest of metal tweezers, but before little Tiki vacated my skin, he left me with a little parting gift. Probably because he was so appreciative of the free room and board, but little Tiki took all of the blood that he borrowed and ever so gratefully vomited it back up into my body along with something special that I've never had before, Lyme disease. Now at the time, I was training to run an Olympic distance triathlon for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Foundation, so I went from being able to conquer miles of terrain by foot, bike, and by sea to not being able to walk up a flight of stairs without feeling exhausted. I was mostly bedridden for months, and uh, for the first time in my life, I started experiencing daily anxiety and panic attacks. Now sometime after that, I had another accident, and it gave me a mild traumatic brain injury that left me with inflammation in two areas of my brain. Now, not wanting to be outdone, the brain injury came with its own strict regimen of bedriddenness, dizziness, anxiety, and other similarly fun symptoms. And these symptoms persisted for so many years and it became so overwhelming that it was all I could focus on all day, every day. And the rest of my life was suffering as a result. My business had just failed, I had close to six figures in debt, and I still had to deal with all the other stuff that we all deal with. Bills I couldn't pay, car trouble, friends who let me down, infidelity from significant others, close friends who passed before their time, you know, life stuff. <laughs> and then just to really top things off, I was diagnosed with stage two melanoma. I had cancer. Now this struggle went on for years and the anxiety and panic attacks paved the way for depression. I started to feel like a broken person and I began to lose all hope. All right, so now that I have sufficiently raised the spirits of everyone in the room, let's get back to that email, the one that was gonna forever change my life. So I'm sitting there after reading this email and I can feel the anxiety bubbling up in my chest. I'm starting to get short of breath and tunnel vision, panic is setting in. Noticing these symptoms, my body only made things worse, so I had to lay down and close my eyes just to fight off the nausea. It must have been hours before I was able to actually reflect on what I just read in that email. My fantasy football team just lost. <laughs> Again. <laughs> Now see, you laugh, but what you don't realize is that this meant I wasn't gonna make the playoffs this year, so now you can see it was serious. <laughs> now while of course I recognize the ridiculousness of this story, I actually think that my reaction is not all that uncommon. I think we can all relate to one time or another feeling completely overwhelmed by an otherwise mundane activity. It could be doing the dishes, doing the laundry, answering emails, whatever. We live in such a fast-paced, stressed-out culture that we're all constantly walking around on edge, never really knowing which mundane thing is going to be our personal trigger to send us over the edge. Nearly half the population report to being so stressed that they lay awake at night. And according to one survey, 57% of people report feeling paralyzed by stress. At the same time, we also live in an age where information on how to become happier has never been more available or abundant. So why isn't it working? I think the issue is, if I'm the type of person where an email about fantasy football a game whose title includes a word akin to make-believe, and that email somehow has the power to send me into the throes of panic, maybe I'm not the type of person who can be expected to dutifully apply this very well-intentioned advice long enough to actually see results. So I think the issue is, maybe the way that we're dealing with stressors is completely wrong. Maybe if we had a way to take our problems and turn them into assets, turn them into the very thing that fuels our success instead of the thing that holds us back, maybe then we can have that long sought after happiness that we're all looking for. So after years of pouring over research from positive psychology and neuroscience, as well as time-tested advice from stoicism, I cobbled together a method that has allowed me to stay happy no matter how many times life keeps punching me in the face. Let's call it the 3P method. Perspective, practice, and planning. Let's start with perspective. First, we're gonna change our perspectives on these so-called negative feelings. And instead of repressing or ignoring these feelings, we're gonna allow them to come up and truly feel them. One of the most common misconceptions about happiness is that if you're a happy person, you're somehow not allowed to feel any kind of sadness or negative emotions. Now, personally, I have had more than one sobbing on the floor, breakdown type moments in response to some of the challenges that I've faced, and I still consider myself a happy person. And those two things aren't in conflict with one another. It's perfectly natural to feel strong emotions as a response to the challenges in our life, and trying to get rid of these feelings is only gonna make them feel worse. 
So instead, we're going to allow those feelings to come up and know that they're actually our body trying to prepare ourselves to better handle the situation that we're in. The next part of perspective is for us to figure out what is and what isn't in our control. And while this may appear simple, discerning which things in our life we have agency over is not quite as simple as it appears, but it's critical to our well-being. We're going to want to direct our focus on the things that are within our control, but first we're going to take a moment to change our perspective on the things that are outside of our control. What if instead of being a victim of your circumstances, you were instead a survivor of them? Again, it seems simple, but this subtle shift has been shown to lead to greater well-being and higher quality of life. Next, we have practice. Have you ever felt so overwhelmed by life that you just feel completely stuck? Yeah, me too. I think we all have, right? So this happens because of the overstimulation of the sympathetic nervous system. That's the thing that sends you into fight or flight mode and essentially shuts down the part of your brain that you need to make rational decisions. In our fast paced modern world, we spend so much of our time in fight or flight mode that we've unconsciously developed habits that make it easier for our body to activate the sympathetic nervous system. In order for us to change this, we need to change our daily practices. We need to consciously develop habits that support activation of the parasympathetic nervous system. That's the thing that's going to calm you down and make you feel relaxed. Daily practices like gratitude, breathing exercises, meditation, or cultivating positive emotions have all been shown to calm the fight or flight response and activate the parasympathetic nervous system. Now we have a limited amount of willpower in our lives, so I find that using that willpower towards developing habits like this is going to give you the most leverage. Over time, these practices will train your body to better handle challenges as they come up and put you in the right mental and physical state to take action. The final step in the three P's is planning. Now I understand that using a day planner is not a new idea, so you probably think it's a little bit silly, but planning has been shown to reduce the negative effects of unfinished tasks on your brain. What this means is getting rid of that feeling of being distracted so that you can actually focus. Planning also exercises your executive function, which research has shown leads to higher confidence. So you remember those things that we identified from step one that are within our control? We're going to want to make a plan for how we're going to change them. We're going to start with the end goal of what we want to happen and then work backwards. We'll break it down into small manageable steps and then we'll get to work. Every day we'll be checking off tasks in our planner and every day we'll be getting little spikes of dopamine that'll help build the motivation and momentum that we need to hit our goals. Over time, these mastery experiences are going to build your confidence and help you develop an internal locus of control. That's the sense that you have control over your circumstances. Studies show this leads to feeling happier, less stressed, and can actually protect you from depression and anxiety. So maybe using a day planner is not so silly after all, huh? I accept your apology. So what does the 3P method look like in the real world? Well, let's look at a made up example about a guy that we'll call appropriately Ted. So Ted works an office job. It's all right. Not his first choice, but not the worst. He's been under a ton of pressure lately at work and the stress is starting to get to him. But on the bright side, Ted's got a piece of cake in the break room fridge, or at least he did have a piece of cake in the fridge. Someone else ate it. So, Here's what normally happens to someone in this situation. Someone else eats your cake. The signal is sent to your amygdala. Your mind perceives the situation as a threat and then sends a signal to the hypothalamus. Your sympathetic nervous system, the fight or flight response, is triggered causing perceptible symptoms. Increased heart rate, rapid breathing, heightened senses. Your mind then perceives these symptoms as a threat to your ability to handle the situation, which triggers the HPA access and your body is flooded with cortisol, the stress hormone. Now you feel terrible and you immediately blame Daryl and IT and start plotting revenge. This cycle continues and over time becomes habit. Neural pathways begin to form, making this pattern easily accessible so that stress and overwhelm become the norm. The result? Stress, anxiety, panic, overwhelm, depression, no cake. So let's look at what happens to Ted when he uses the 3P method. So someone eats Ted's cake, signal is sent to the amygdala, Ted no longer views this as a threat but instead allows those feelings to come up and directs his focus on the actions that are within his control. This triggers a challenge response where the sympathetic nervous system is still activated but with a lowered cortisol response. Because of Ted's new routines, he's trained his parasympathetic nervous system to help return his heart rate and breathing back to baseline more quickly. As his body returns to calm, he uses his planner to figure out what action steps he can take. Stop at the grocery store, get some new cake ingredients, bake that new cake at home, eat that cake, and then of course, don't put your cake in the break room fridge anymore. As Ted accomplishes these tasks and checks them off in his planner, his hypothalamus releases dopamine, which makes him feel better and locks in these experiences, building motivation and confidence to continue further. So he then moves on to more ambitious goals. Maybe he quits his job, opens a bake shop, and invites Daryl, but limits free samples. Over time, these accomplishments give him a sense of progress and build self-efficacy, the sense that you can accomplish what you set out to do. This in turn leads to lower anxiety and greater sense of optimism and a higher likelihood that Ted will hit his goals and succeed. Ted's locus of control shifts from an external one to an internal one, so he now moves forward with the firm belief that no matter what happens in his life, he has control over how he will react to it. 
The result of this approach? Control, confidence, productivity, optimism, success, and cake. So the goal isn't to succeed despite your challenges, but instead to become the best version of yourself specifically because of your challenges. We can't stop life from being crazy, but we can prepare ourselves to handle anything it throws at us, including a right hook. Thank you.